I'm very excited to welcome Nikki Watt to the stage, here to talk about Terraform and evolving Terraform for your infrastructure. Please join me in welcoming Nikki to the stage. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. So, I'm going to be talking about evolving your infrastructure with Terraform. So just a little bit about me and the company. So um, I'm the CTO at a company called Open Credo, and we're a hands-on sort of consultancy that specializes in helping organizations to adapt and adopt emerging technologies to solve their business problems. And quite often this involves building sort of end-to-end -end sort of large-scale applications and systems. And a large part of making this a success is by implementing continuous DevOps practices and tooling and approaches. And obviously this is where uh, much of the sort of HashiCorp tooling comes in quite handy. So as a sort of premier HashiCorp partner, we've dealt with quite a lot of different clients uh, along their sort of Terraform journeys and kind of helped them with that. And this talk is really going to look to kind of pull some of the insights from the various clients that we've worked with and some of the sort of uh, journeys that they've had in terms of evolving Terraform as they've kind of moved along. So in terms of this talk, the agenda is going to be primarily focusing on how you can evolve Terraform to progressively adapt and manage uh, your infrastructure as your organization and your infrastructure kind of changes. We're then also going to briefly kind of look at the related topic of orchestrating Terraform and some of the sort of challenges and, and sort of areas around that. And then we're going to conclude. So to start off, what we're going to do is we're going to follow a journey of a sort of representative client, or in this case, a combination of representative clients as they embark on a Terraform journey, starting out using Terraform to create their infrastructure. I'm going to highlight some of the sort of common pain points that people sort of typically uh, sort of encounter as they go along, their, along this journey, and then have a look at how we can actually evolve Terraform as we go through this process. So hopefully as a result, we'll kind of emerge with a better understanding of how you can use Terraform to evolve infrastructure. And in doing so, we'll also identify some common sort of patterns and approaches that people typically sort of find themselves in. I do want to stress there's no absolute right or wrong way of doing things. Different clients have got very different uh, sort of setups and requirements. And although I'm going to give you a sort of linear type progression of how this representative set of clients would go through, yours may not look exactly like that. But the aim is really to highlight the sort of main areas that you might find uh, as you go along your Terraform journey. To make this talk a little bit sort of less abstract, a little bit more concrete, we're going to say we have our uh, representative client, and they're trying to deliver a sample system, which is an e-commerce system. And this is uh, sort of delivered as a set of microservices in an Amazon infrastructure. And in this case, they're choosing to use Terraform to actually create the underlying uh, environment itself that underpins uh, Terraform. And it's using uh, Kubernetes as the mechanism for uh, actually deploying the microservices. So there's a new feature in Terraform, which is actually create, uh, using um, Terraform to deploy the microservices through Kubernetes itself. It's not going to be used for that. We're literally going to use it to create the underlying infrastructure. The infrastructure is relatively simple to begin with. We start off with an Amazon VPC. We have a public subnet where we're going to have things like a NAT gateway, a bastion box. And then we also got a single sort of private subnet where we're going to house our Kubernetes cluster. So it'll have maybe a single master node and, and three, uh, three nodes to begin with. And for any database needs, we're going to use Amazon RDS uh, to sort of make that possible. So we have Terry. She's starting out as a DevOps engineer. And she just discovered programmable infrastructure and Terraform. Really excited. This is going to make a big difference to help her really kind of manage the infrastructure differently. And to start off with, she creates a sample proof of concept for kind of getting up to speed with Terraform. And quite often, it will start looking something like this. So there'll be a single sort of Terraform file, which will define the resources that she wants to sort of uh, create, some hard-coded values, maybe a few um, sort of variables as well, and also a local TF state file. And she likes what she sees. She's quite happy with this. Proof of concept's going OK. So she even starts creating the test infrastructure off the back of this. Now, time moves on, pressure builds, and the need to deliver more sort of formal environments becomes a bit more urgent. And her boss says, actually, I really need this production infrastructure yesterday. Please, can you create it? So she decides, that's OK. My best course of action, I'm just going to take the proof of concept setup that I originally created, and I'm going to create my test and production infrastructure out of that. She basically starts off, she makes a copy of the test resources that she originally had and just duplicates that for the production setup. But she thinks, well, maybe, that's, maybe I can do a little bit better. At least I can maybe create two separate files, one for the Terraform production setup, one for the Terraform test setup. And, but we still maintain things with a separate sort of TF state file. 
She runs Terraform Apply, the test infrastructure comes up, the production infrastructure comes up, and all is well. Now, time passes again. The sort of test team come along and they say, actually, I need a change to the test infrastructure. We want to potentially look at expanding the Kubernetes cluster. We need to increase the CIDR range of the VPC. And can you please make the, chest, the, the change for us in test? So she says, this is easy. I'm just going to go to my test file. I'm going to change the, the particular kind of setup, make it a little bit bigger. But I also, I really don't want to make sure, I want to make sure I don't impact production. So I'm just going to rename my terraform.tf file to a terraform.tf.backup file, make sure that Terraform doesn't actually uh, sort of change any of the production infrastructure. So Terraform apply, off she goes. And as you can imagine, things didn't really go too well for Terry. So although she renamed the backup file, uh, as you're all aware, Terraform operates off the TF state file as a single source of truth. And Terraform thought that actually she's removed the production resources, so it landed up deleting everything in production. This initial setup is what I would call a classic Terralith setup. So this is my name for a relatively sort of monolithic configuration. Um, and one of the typical reasons why you see this pattern emerging with clients is because they take a sort of proof of concept setup and they just evolve it quite quickly into production without necessarily thinking about splitting things up. And it happens more often than you think. So the characteristics of a Terralith setup is that you have a single state file which rules everything. So your test and your production infrastructure. You also have typically a single state file where all of the definitions are created, some hard-coded config and management in local state. Now, the primary issue with the Terralith is that you can't manage the individual environments differently. So it's very risky from an organizational perspective to go and make a change for a test system, and you inadvertently change production. So Terry has noted this, and she says, this is problematic. But I've, I found a few other problems with this particular setup. The config is not that intuitive. I've got this big kind of file of stuff, and I'm not really sure exactly sort of what's going on here. And it's, it's quite a lot of maintenance for me. There's a lot of duplication definitions, and maybe there's a way that we can try and sort this out. So she says, let's get some help in and see if we can evolve this. So we land up evolving the infrastructure for the first time, and we move to what I would call the multi terralith So this is basically the sort of second phase where the biggest change that you can make to make this infrastructure better is to have separate environment state management. And this is a massive bonus in terms of reducing the risk from an operational perspective of at least not sort of destroying your production infrastructure as you go along. In order to deal with some of the sort of maintenance and the readability side of things, we're also going to move to multiple ter um, Terraform definition files and start using variables a little bit better. In terms of actually sort of uh, managing the environment separately, in our single sort of repository that we had before, we just create two different sort of directories, a test and a production infrastructure. We copy all the resources um, over where well, we duplicate it, and we make sure that we have a separate TF state file managing both our test and our production setup. To help make things a little bit more reasonable, we've actually broken that single file up also into multiple files. Now, different clients do this differently. Sometimes they'll break it down at a sort of technical level. So in this case, she decided to go for networks and VMs, but other people will break it up in a sort of logical kind of components as well. But whatever makes sense, that's, that's fine. And also, to make things a little bit easier to kind of read and manage, we've now got variables. So at least we can define what are the aspects that I want to make configurable in my environment compared to the stuff that I want to sort of have hard-coded. And we at least sort of evolve our infrastructure to get to a point where it's a little bit more manageable now. So our original pain points that we had with the Terralith was that we can't manage our environment separately. It was quite hard to understand. And there was a lot of a sort of maintenance in terms of the duplication. With our multi terralith we've definitely ticked the first box. We've at least managed to get to a setup now where we can manage our environment separately. And we've done some work around making the configuration a bit more intuitive. You can argue there's probably still a little bit more to do in that case. And in order to kind of move forward and also address some of the duplication, we need to evolve our infrastructure again. So we move on to the third evolution of our Terraform setup. And this is one that I would call uh, the TerraMod setup. And as the name implies, it's uh, a version of Terraform that looks to really kind of make use of modules in order to create reusable components that you can start composing your infrastructure out of. And Terraform has got built-in support for modules, and it's, we're going to use this as the base kind of building block in order to change our Terraform setup. 
So the characteristics of the Terramod setup is that, as I said before, we're going to go for reusable modules. Are we going to change our environment definitions to start composing themselves out of these modular definitions that we're going to create? We're also going to have to change the repository structure a little bit as we kind of go along as well. Terra's decided, this is how I want to logically break up my modules. She's got to find some way of breaking the modules up, and she's decided to go for three main areas. So there's a sort of a core area, um, a Kubernetes uh, cluster area, and a database. So for the core kind of area, she sees this really as the fundamental part of um, the Amazon sort of structure, things like the VPCs, all of the subnets, and also the creation of things like the Bastion host. Then there's a Kubernetes cluster, which is going to hold all of the sort of Kubernetes setup, and a separate area for the database, and she's going to have her module split up that way. So in terms of restructuring, in terms of our, our sort of single repository that we had, we now have an environments directory, and we create a sort of test and prod area as we had before, and we also have a separate modules area. We also then start to define the different logical sort of components. In this case, we've split it up by the three areas, the sort of database, core, and Kubernetes, and we define that underneath the modules area. Now, for each module, uh, if we have a look at the sort of core module over here, we want to define all of the resources that make up just the creation of that one particular kind of, uh, the components involved in that particular piece. So for the core setup, we create things like the Amazon VPC and the public subnet and the private subnets that underpin the core kind of area. We also want to make sure that we have a very clear contract that defines what are the inputs, what are the outputs that, that constitute this particular module. The convention that I tend to use here is to have an input.tf file which very much kind of specifies this is what I expect to be able to configure my module with and an output.tf to configure the, uh, the outputs. So in this particular example, you can pass in things like the side range, how big your VPC is going to be, uh, and likewise, how big you want maybe the, the sort of DMZ siders and the, the private subnet as well. We also have an output, um, and this is required because our modules, we're going to have to start composing them together, which means that we have to understand what are the outputs that I want to uh, make available from my module so that I, the other modules can actually sort of start composing them. And this has to be done explicitly by exposing outputs. Yeah, as I said before, we want to make sure that the modules have got a clear kind of contract as to what we expect the inputs and the outputs to be. So for each core environment, the Terraform file that we have uh, now becomes more of a gluing module. So rather than having all of the sort of resource together, we now specify actually my environment file consists of a Kubernetes cluster, a core module, and a database module. And these refer to the, the modules that we've just created here. But we also have to start weaving the inputs uh, from one into the other. Because we're using modules, we can take the uh, output of a module that we explicitly created in our output.tf file and weave that straight into um, one of the other ones. So the example over here is we have our core module and uh, that creates our private subnet. And we need that private subnet ID to be able to be passed as input into our Kubernetes cluster module so that we can make sure it gets created in the right subnet. And the example is, is just sort of standard Terraform kind of code as to how you do that. Crucially, because all of the uh, modules are configurable, there's a very clear contract which means that for the different environments, we can start configuring things differently. So maybe you want to say in your test environment, I only need three nodes for my Kubernetes clusters, but actually in production, I want five. And now that you've got uh, separate areas for your sort of test and production, you can have different variables that configure things differently. So some clients will take this even further, and they'll actually have quite different test and production setups. So some of them are not quite as complicated, the sort of test and or production setups. And you can compose things differently depending on how you're, depending on what you're trying to do, basically. So if we go back to the multi terolith which was the previous kind of setup, we'd at least managed to evolve our environment separately. We had more intuitive configuration. And with the Terramod setup, we've really kind of at least taken the intuitive con configuration much more, a lot forward, basically. So the environments now, when you have a look at them, you can say, oh, my environment co is composed out of a Kubernetes cluster, a database, and a, um, a, a core module as well. We've gone some way to reducing the um, duplicate definitions. So previously, we were duplicating everything in the test and the production setup. Now we're composing it with modules, and we're just passing in different values. And that's really kind of made the, the setup a lot more dry, or don't repeat yourself. 
which is the programmer um, acronym. So this is great. We now have to move on though to the next setup, which will allow us to further reduce the uh, duplication. We need to evolve our infrastructure again. And this is what I call the power Teramod setup. And this one really builds on the sort of Teramod setup. It takes the use of modules to a new level. And you'll end up having nested modules or modules within modules. And the characteristics of the Teramod setup is that you have um, these nested modules. And they typically kind of come in two different flavors. There's a set of base modules, which are more low-level infrastructure type setups. And then you have the logical or the system-specific modules, which are the ones that we've kind of seen now. Sometimes people will end up actually creating their own separate module repository. For the moment, we're just going to stick with one, but this is also something which uh, people end up doing. So where we left off, we had our structure, where we had the environments, we had our modules definition, and we had, we had already kind of structured things to having our logically composed modules uh, as we had before. So now we simply just add these base modules as well. And the example that we have here is maybe you want very low-level modules that says, this is exactly how I create a VPC in Amazon, or this is how I create a public or private subnet in Amazon. Uh, And those are the sort of base infrastructure-specific setups. Previously, in our core module, we had all of the direct resources being defined in there. So we had the VPC and the subnet. And this changes now to suddenly being composed of modules itself. So we have our core module being composed of our base modules. So, and it doesn't have to sort of only be this way. You can compose system modules from system modules and base modules from base modules. It really depends the level that you want to go. But, there's a but. Um, There is a current issue in Terraform which prevents you from fully being able to sort of take advantage of this. And that is the ability to support a count parameter for the modules. So as some of you are aware, in some of the sort of resources, you can typically say, uh, I'm in an instance, I want five of these instances, and Terraform will take care of creating that for you. Unfortunately, you can't do that for modules. So you can't say, I want five of this module and have it kind of created on the fly for you. And it's a little bit of a pain, because what you land up doing is in your environment Terraform file, you land up having to duplicate these definitions. So if you wanted maybe three, say, private subnets, if that's how you define your modules, you'd literally have to go and define the module three times in the environment configuration file. So it's a little bit of a pain, but you can can kind of get around it. So our Teramod recap from previously, as I said, it had addressed most of the sort of duplicate definitions and things. Our Power Teramod take that even further with our nested modules. And we've kind of got to the point where we've managed to reduce it as far as we can, given the sort of current restrictions. So this is great. Terry's really chuffed. Things are working out very well for her. And um, she hasn't accidentally destroyed production recently, which is a good thing. She understands her code. In fact, she's building a team now. And she's got some new team members that she wants to teach the ropes. So recently, she got a little bit of a heads up from the finance guys, though. And they said, eh, we've been getting some information, some analytics about the environment. And your bastion box is really costing a lot of money. Um, and I think it's over-provisioned, and you need, to, you need to reduce the size. So she reckons this is not a problem. I'm going to, you know, it's a really simple change. I can give it to one of my new team members, Frankie, and he's going to make the change for me. So Frankie goes along. He downloads the repository. He locates the correct environment production file, and he says, where's the variable? Oh, there it is. It's a bastion flavor. R4 large, probably a little bit big. Let's make it an M4 large, and this should be fine. I double check. Yes, it is the variable that's going into my core module. That's where I've defined the bastion box. Everything is good. He didn't get the memo about doing a Terraform plan first. He reckons all is well. I'm going to do Terraform apply. So unfortunately for him, things also didn't work out all that well. So he now seems to have unexpectedly triggered a rebuilding of his Kubernetes nodes. So what happened there? So in this particular case, all he wanted to do was change the bastion box flavor. Unfortunately, there was a little bit of a typo in the configuration. And the same variable that was being used to configure the um, bastion box was passed into the Kubernetes node cluster. And as a result, obviously, Terraform Terraform thought, well, the Kubernetes nodes are changing, so I'm going to rebuild rebuild the Kubernetes cluster. Now, you might have said if he'd done a plan, he would have seen this, but he was was quite confident anyway. And that also happens a lot more often than you think. Now, 
although it's not quite as bad as taking out the whole of production, we have hit the next pain point that a lot of people sort of tend to hit in these kind of circumstances. And that is that they're unable to change one part of the system without seemingly affecting a, an unrelated other part of their infrastructure. And in order to deal with that, we again need to look at evolving our Terraform to the next kind of phase of its evolution. So we go for pass five. And this takes us to what I would call the Terra services setup. And this really looks at taking the sort of logical components that we kind of had before and treating those as isolated units and managing them independently. This will definitely kind of isolate the risk and the management that, that people have in terms of managing the infrastructure where all I wanted to do was change the Bastion box and somehow I affected my Kubernetes cluster. But if we can, if we can manage the core uh, sort of infrastructure separately from the Kubernetes cluster, that will allow you to at least get around some of these uh, big sort of risk components. And the name is akin to microservices because I do actually think there's some kind of similarity in the evolution of how we've kind of got here. So the characteristics of the Terra services is that we have, uh, we kind of break our components up into logical modules and we manage them separately. So now we move to having one state file per component rather than just per environment. And typically, if, if you haven't already done so already, you will start moving to a distributed or remote state type of setup. Um, and this is definitely required and helpful when you start moving to teams as well. But uh, this comes with additional complexity. So as with microservices, when you start moving to microservices, suddenly you've now got to kind of glue these things together. And as we'll see, moving to this kind of setup introduces additional operational complexity, as Armin was saying in his analogy earlier. So in our power, for, in our power mod sort of setup, we saw that we had these three different areas and we had created them as modules. But it was still ruled by a single environment file, uh, a state file for that environment. With Terra services, we're now going to have one state file ruling each of these. So we'll end up going from one, one Terraform state file for each of the environments to having one for each of the main components that we have per, uh, per environment. So in this case, we'll end up having six. In terms of the implications of connecting things together, obviously that needs to change now. So previously, this was the TerraMod setup where we were weaving the module inputs and outputs into each other. And that now needs to change so that we can deal with these completely separate state files. So there's not a massive kind of change that you need to do to make this work, but um, the setup is that previously we still had our reference to our core module. So here we have the, the core sort of Terraform um, module file itself. And it still incorporates the core module itself, but now it explicitly has to also export the output of the, the module to make it output for itself so that other services that want to reuse its core inputs will be able to do so. so. The example here is the private subnet ID. So the core, the core setup needs to output that so that when the Kubernetes state file, or when the Kubernetes service needs to um, import it, it will be able to get hold of it. And although it's redundant here, we start also getting the definition of the Terraform backend. This is a new feature in, in 0.9 plus. And although it's redundant, you don't need to specify the local setup. I've put it here because I want to kind of show how you move to the remote state moving forward. So in terms of how you configure the components that actually want to now consume another component, it starts looking something like this. So you need to import the component that you actually want to um, connect to. In this case, our Kubernetes cluster says there's some stuff that the um, sort of core component output, and I need that. So we use the Terraform remote state uh, data source reference, and we, in this case, just point to the local backend where our core uh, TF state file was, and then we just import, we import that and we pass it through to our Kubernetes uh, sort of setup moving forward. Frankie and Terry are much happier again. They further isolated the sort of changes to the system, and they've reduced at least the mess of completely uh, sort of messing up one part of the infrastructure that's potentially unrelated to the other. But she's noted that there's a few other problems now. And she's dealing with this local state file, which is proving a little bit more problematic than it was in the past, because now there's sort of more than one of her, and it seems to be tripping her team up. And you know, not everybody kind of pulls from Git uh, sort of religiously. And although there's warnings when they run Terraform, it's still a little bit painful. Security are also not that happy, because they've said, actually, there's some secrets which are exposed in the state file, and you're just committing it up into Git. This is not a good thing. 
And as she's noted before, this is not a simple case of just running her Terraform apply anymore. She now needs to actually think about what she's doing because if she hasn't run the core component first, the VPC and everything won't exist. So there needs to be an order of how she does things. So she needs to run the core first, then the Kubernetes cluster, then the database or whatever the particular kind of setup is. So in terms of moving to a remote state setup, this is really simple. So previously we had the local reference to the Terraform state file. Uh, and now all we do is we change and we say, actually, I want to use a remote backend. In this case, it's Amazon S3. And we can also then get rid of that TF state file out of Git, which will also help us with some of the sort of security issues that we had before where we're committing clear text um, uh, secrets exposed in our state file into Git. For the services actually needing to uh, make use of these particular sort of environments, they also then basically just use, they, they change the Terraform remote state file to now refer to the, the S3 backend instead of the local backend. And as a bonus, from a team perspective, we start getting more things. So specifically with the S3 backend, you have the concept of locking. And this is only a very recent thing that was introduced from sort of 0.9 onwards. But it's really handy from a team perspective when you want to try and prevent some of your teammates from potentially clobbering your stuff. Um, from a security perspective, at least with the S3 backend, we can encrypt it, which means that we don't have our Terraform state file at rest with the secrets exposed. And yeah, it's, it's a move in the right direction for teams. From a Git repository perspective, we can keep absolutely everything in the same state file. But what we've seen also in some organizations and in some uh, sort of clients is that they land up having different teams that are responsible for different parts of the infrastructure. So you may have a core team that's responsible for setting up fundamental sort of part of the infrastructure, the VPCs, because maybe there's direct connects or something that's a little bit more complicated to set up, and then other kind of teams which are responsible for creating other, other sections. And once you've structured your code in a, in a sort of mechanism or in a way like this, it's a little bit easier to start migrating these into their own repositories and dealing with them as independent entities. So you can literally just take the core kind of module and uh, create a, a completely separate repo in order to sort of deal with that. If you were using these sort of common nested modules as well, what happens is that typically people will have to actually create a common uh, sort of module repository itself and then reuse the references for the, the Git references in their individual modules in order to incorporate that, which also brings in versioning and other kinds of things which I, I won't get into at the moment, but that's a consideration as well. So our Terra services setup has allowed us to evolve and really kind of manage our infrastructure much more in a sort of much better kind of way. We've isolated and reduced our risk, and we've now aided with at least trying to move towards a, a setup where the teams uh, can start uh, working a little bit uh, better. We also have the remote setup, uh, remote state, which has definitely made things better. But there's no such thing as a free lunch, and uh, moving to such a setup requires quite a lot more orchestration and sort of management as it did before. So the last part of the talk that I'm going to talk about is orchestrating Terraform and some of the sort of concerns and challenges that people have in this particular area for the Terra services set up, but in general as well. So this was our target infrastructure. And we always have to have some kind of system or processes or tooling that we use to run and orchestrate and actually manage our Terraform. So just as there was a progression with the structure of our Terraform, I'd argue that there's also a similar thinking in terms of how do we evolve the processes that go around this and managing that as we evolve as a team as well. So to begin with, we had Terry, and all she had was her single developer laptop. Not a problem. It was a relatively simple kind of setup. There was a single Git repository. Uh, we had a local state file, which was committed into Git. And with one state file per environment, it's relatively simple. As a human process, you just go and run Terraform, plan, apply as you see fit, and generate everything as well. And when there's one of you, you can typically get away with it. When you start having more developers that are trying to do things concurrently, things become a little bit more problematic. Now you've suddenly got to sort of coordinate amongst each other, make sure you don't overwrite everybody's stuff, uh, make sure you're working off the latest code, et cetera. And from a human perspective, and at least not stepping on everybody's sort of toes, moving to actual proper sort of remote setup, something like S3 is a massive win from, uh, at least from that perspective. This is not only restricted to the Terra services setup, many people get to remote state before them, but from a team perspective, it's, it's quite important. 
It also gives you things like locking if you're in the later versions of Terraform and a central place to manage, uh, to manage your, your state. But it's also not perfect. You can still have people that pull the wrong version of the code, and even though you've got the state in a central place, you can run it against the wrong version of the code and still get yourself into, into a bit of problems. And as the setup itself starts getting more complicated, so with the Terra services, now suddenly we have multiple state files. And this needs coordination and orchestration. So how do I know that I need to run my core module first and then my Kubernetes one, et cetera, et cetera? You can't just rely on Terraform to do that because you've now got to sort of make this work yourself. And if I'm honest, I think the main mechanism that people use to do this is just manually talking to each other, readme files, and it's run this one first, then this one, then that one, then that one, et cetera, et cetera. And that is the primary mechanism that a lot of people actually use for this. Additionally, we didn't quite go into detail on this, but with the Terra services setup, sometimes what people end up doing is um, they don't just create the infrastructure, they also will invoke some kind of provisioning tool, so something like Ansible or Puppet, in order to actually install software on the box afterwards. So if we think about the Kubernetes cluster, maybe you use Ansible or Puppet to actually install uh, Kubernetes in the, setup, in the setup itself. And when you start having to share variables between Terraform and these provisioners, it also starts getting really messy. So you can output things from Terraform and have scripts which scrape it and then try and somehow get it into Puppet and sort of Ansible or whatever. But as a mechanism for dealing with this, some people will move to a shared services type setup. And that will be running something like console or vault to actually store the values so that you can start sharing it between the, the different components that need it. But this starts getting a little complicated because now you seem to have introduced another whole system that builds the system or builds the infrastructure. So who builds the infrastructure that builds the infrastructure? And you know, somebody's got to create the S3 buckets, somebody's got to create the vault cluster and the col uh, console cluster, et cetera. And again, what typically happens, I'd say, is that many clients actually deal with this as a completely separate kind of area. So if they get to the point where this is the type of setup they have, they'll have a, a whole kind of team which is dedicated to actually uh, managing the infrastructure that builds the infrastructure. But as an initial kind of progression, what a, a lot of people will do is at least try and start moving towards some kind of centralized way of dealing with things. And the first step on their journey, I would argue quite often is to reach for something like Jenkins as a place to at least have Terraform, uh, a single place where you can run Terraform. So you might kind of define your Terraform configuration and all the developers or all of the people who are involved in creating the infrastructure, just go to Jenkins and say, run the creation of whatever the, the particular kind of uh, environment is that you want. So it's a single place that people can see what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. It's not perfect because uh, stuff goes wrong and then inevitably you have to download it onto your laptop anyway and taint and apply and fix kind of things, but it's the first step that most people go for. But quite often, many clients will actually land up writing their own custom systems and tooling. And you see this quite a lot. So there's a lot of bash scripts out there which bring things together, um, quite complex systems as well. And we've actually been involved in helping a few people kind of set up some of these kind of things. And you, you'll see things like Terra Grunt and Terra Help and various sort of combination of, of systems coming together to actually create the, the tooling that ultimately is used to build your infrastructure. And there are even SaaS offerings, so things like HashiCorp Enterprise products, which are also there to try and help with some of this kind of setup. What's my point? My point is that it's not just about the structure of your code. You also need to think about how you're going to evolve the processes and the sort of orchestration system that manages this. There's no silver bullet here. I wish there was, but there's quite often a lot of sort of manual intervention and coordination that's required for many people to get this right and custom systems of kind of gluing things together. But the key thing is to actually think about it because if you completely ignore this, when you start having multiple people trying to uh, uh, sort of create your infrastructure at the same time, you really will land up in a lot of trouble. So the conclusion uh, for this talk is that we've had a look at how you can evolve your Terraform setup. And we did this by taking a journey through a sort of representative set of clients and looking at the sort of pain points that they had along the way and how they can evolve things. These are the sort of typical kind of setups that we see in clients. Not everybody lands up in exactly one of these setups, and there's probably various other combinations as well. But the one you definitely don't want to be in is the Terralith, where you are managing your test and your production infrastructure in the same state file. If you are there, I'd say the 
definitely the definite area you'd at least want to get to is the multi terralith where you're managing your, your test and your production infrastructure separately. In terms of moving to a more readability, sort of maintainability uh, side of things, the TerraMod and the Power TerraMod setup and its use of modules was a way to try and uh, sort of deal with that sort of complexity and make things a little bit more uh, comprehensible and also maintainable so that people who come into your organization can also start sort of understanding how is it that you've created your infrastructure and you're managing it. With the tariff services kind of set up, we saw that this was the way where we can kind of uh, get to the point where we don't accidentally destroy different parts of the infrastructure that maybe we weren't kind of uh, expecting to do. And the benefits involved in that is that it can help sort of moving towards a, a multi-team setup where you've got different teams or different roles responsible for creating different part of the infrastructure. The nice thing with that as well is that there's some infrastructure moves at very different paces. So the, if you think about the core module, sort of creating that uh, is not necessarily going to change that often as compared to maybe the way you configure your cube cluster or something like that. And don't forget about the people. For simple setups with single man setups, it's quite easy to you know, just have a, a very simple kind of setup. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, there's nothing wrong with having a simple setup. But as you evolve, as you have more teams and uh, more complicated setups, you need to think about these things. So with that, uh, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I hope that was helpful. <laughs>